whole question of whether we are supposed to keep the Mosaic Law or be Torah observant is nothing new. It's been around for many, many years, and ever since I started the channel, it's been something that has been brought up pretty regularly by people in comments and emails, and most of the time it's done in a, in a fairly gentle, civil way. Other times it is not, and um, sometimes people are actually going so far as to accuse you of preaching lawlessness if you uh, rejected this whole notion of keeping the Torah based on what the Bible says. I've been accused of uh, sending people to hell, in fact, or because they perceive me to be preaching lawlessness, which is a pretty serious accusation, obviously. And one of the verses that gets quoted almost constantly is from Matthew 5, uh, in verse 17, where Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a pen, will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So then, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise will, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes they'll quote those last two verses, 19 and 20, but sometimes not. But it struck me the other day that one thing I, I don't think I have ever heard someone do, and this really kind of speaks volumes to this whole matter, is never do I hear these people accusing me of teaching lawlessness. Continue reading down in chapter 5, uh, in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the ancients, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother Raka will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be subject to the fire of hell. So he's talking about one of the Ten Commandments there, right? Thou shalt not murder. And then he touches on another one in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to depart in hell. So when it comes to this whole accusation that I know many, many people are coming to believe because I, I hear them saying this. And this is what is just extremely disturbing and troubling. They, they really believe that by observing Torah, that is the definition of obedience to God, to keep his law. And look what it just said there in, in Matthew 5. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And of course, it is that matter of what Jesus meant by came to fulfill them that is at the core of the entire matter. And so what those of us who are not observing Torah, who are not trying to observe the Mosaic Law, observe, if I make nothing else clear in this video, that this accusation that this is a, a call to lawlessness is absolutely absurd and, and rather insane, actually, because of what Jesus himself clearly says and what he explains by what he means to fulfill the law. And when you look down in 21 and 27, Jesus did not do away with murder. You see that he's expanding. He's expanding the true essence of what the law is all about. That murder is not just about killing another human being physically but that the root of murder is, is anger against your brother. That that is really the essence of murder. That's the heart of the matter. So that's great. If you, you think you can accomplish not physically killing somebody in your whole life, well, and you, you think you've got that one down, but the way Jesus expands it is that it goes so far beyond that. To every careless word, every hateful thing that you might say to somebody is just as serious in the eyes of God. So that's not lawlessness. 
that's actually expounding the law to a, such a greater degree to where it penetrates into your heart and your thoughts and your word and every action you do. It takes the concept of obedience and just makes it vastly more all-encompassing. And it's the same thing with adultery. And it just really struck me the other day that when you get attacked by these people who want to accuse you of lawlessness, preaching lawlessness, as if that's what they're really so fired up about. Lawlessness being sin, right? And they're if the whole motive is really because you're just so passionate about obedience to God and ridding yourself from sin. It's funny that the topics that always come up are, are things like, yeah, worshiping on Saturday or observing the Sabbath or the dietary laws, things like this. I can't think of a single time ever where somebody who was trying to keep me that we are, we are still under the Mosaic Law, that we are still called to observe Torah, that they were ever concerned with something like eradicating lust from your heart, your mind, and life. I'm not saying nobody un understands that, but you don't hear people emphasizing that. That's not the first thing, that's not what they're coming at you with. That's not what they're so concerned about. I mean, Jesus is so concerned about it that he's talking about cutting off your hand or gouging out your eye. Because those are just, you know, parts of your body that are going to die anyways. Obviously, we all know he's not commanding us to gouge out our eyes. But he's making a very powerful, serious point about how the root of sin is inward. And when you get to the point of actually committing adultery with another person, you're only acting out the lustful desire that was already kindled within you. And that's where the law of God has to penetrate. And you have to become <laughs> obedient to God in your heart level first. Which is what the whole thing is about. What the whole gospel is about. What the whole understanding of the, the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law is all about. And the Bible talks about this at such length. It is really astounding that so many people seem to just have no comprehension of it. And they want to quote verses like, you know, Matthew 5. As if people like myself and, and so many others have never read that. And so the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. If you do not understand that difference, then you don't understand the gospel. And you don't know why Jesus came. You don't know what he did on the cross. That's why this whole Torah observance issue, Torah keeping, is so serious and so deceptive. Because it really comes down to distorting the gospel. I recently engaged in an exchange with, with an individual about the, the whole issue of circumcision. You know, one of the topics that comes up with this whole matter of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law is the topic of circumcision, for obvious reasons. Um, circumcision was, was the first commandment given to, to Abraham, right, as a sign that he and his household would be devoted to God, right? And so circumcision was so terribly, terribly important to, to the Jews. So when anyone tries to talk about being called to, to keep the Mosaic Law, you can't remove circumcision from it because it, it came before Moses. It was kind of the singular iconic thing, the singular sign for those who were supposed to be dedicated to God and who obeyed his commandments, right? It was kind of like, kind of like wearing a t-shirt, you know, so it's a sign. It's kind of like if you wear, like if you put on a t-shirt that says, I serve God, or I obey God, I follow God. Except it's, <laughs> except a t-shirt is rather easy to put on, whereas uh, circumcision was a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a commitment, let's put it that way, right? A little bit more sensitive. You know, it's not something you do lightly. It's easy to put on a t-shirt and take it off or, or whatever. People would probably be a lot less uh, compelled to just casually put on the, the circumcision t-shirt. <laughs> and that, that may seem like a weird analogy, but I think it makes a lot of sense when you really look at what it says in Romans. In Romans 2, talking about circumcision. For circumcision benefits you if you observe the law, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. 
Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised, but who fulfills the law, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That man's praise is not from men, but from God. And so when I hear sometimes, because I bring this up all the time, I bring up circumcision to uh, Torah folks, right? And uh, you get some really interesting answers, various ways they try and kind of squirm around this because it's so clear. But a lot of times, basically, they say, well, you know, circumcision of the heart comes first, but you still have to be circumcised in the flesh in, in order to be obedient. But even that is totally just obliterated by what it says in Romans 2, where it says, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Because, yes, we've all sinned. We've all broken the law. So that, <laughs> going back to the t-shirt and analogy, if circumcision was like this permanent sign, right? It wasn't like a t-shirt you could take off. It says, I serve God. It was like this permanent... I mean, think about that in the days of the... <laughs> the days of Abraham and Moses back in the Old Testament time. You're going to take... <laughs> You better trust that whoever's doing that circumcision knows what they're doing, right? It's not like you're you're not in a doctor's office with a scalpel or whatever. It's like somebody's going to pull out their desert knife and uh, <laughs> he's just going to remove that for you. It was extremely painful and it took several days to, to like heal and recover. But it says that if you've broken the law, your circumcision has now become nothing. It's like that t-shirt that says, Oh, I serve God. I love God perfectly. I obey God's law. Well, now it's a lie. Because you just broke God's law. So yeah, you've still got the t-shirt on, but it's... It's not true anymore. So then outward circumcision. Circumcision of the flesh. It was supposed to mean that you were... You were adherent to God's law is now a hypocritical sign. It's no longer true. So it's become uncircumcised. But then it says something even more interesting. It says, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? Which is interesting because if you're not physically circumcised, according to, you know, Torah, how are you keeping the law's requirements? Because the law required you to be circumcised. How is that not a complete self-contradiction? Unless, what it's talking about, as it says further down, it's about the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And again, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. So the process of cutting off a piece of very sensitive skin is just an outward sign that doesn't mean anything it's about as useful a way of measuring what's really going on in someone's heart or whether they really are obedient to God as someone wearing a t-shirt that says, I obey God. All right? So the circumcision thing alone, alone, blows apart this delusion of thinking that you need to put yourself back under Mosaic law. Because now you're just clinging to a dirty, lying t-shirt, basically. But then they'll still come up with uh, convoluted arguments trying to to weasel out of that one. And again, they want to go back to the Sabbath and Saturday. They want to go back to the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath. And they'll say, well, just because we understand that Jesus is our Sabbath, well, some of them will, because this is precisely what it says in Hebrews, that he is our Sabbath rest. His finished work is the ultimate fulfillment of, of the prophetic picture that God laid out in Genesis with the seven days of creation, where he rested on the seventh day. Jesus is that permanent seventh day completed rest. His work, his perfect sinless life, his perfect sacrificial death, his resurrection, his sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. He is our hope. He is our rest. That goes way beyond. Again, it's an expansion of the understanding of, of Sabbath. It's an expansion of this law to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, to honor and keep and guard and protect and revere 
Jesus' completed work that he did on earth at the cross and the empty tomb and every word that he spoke when he was teaching that is now recorded in the Gospels for us to obey. Do you know how many commandments that Jesus gave? <laughs> you want to talk about the, the 600 and something laws of the, uh, the Old Testament Mosaic Law, which of course most Tor folks are not even going to try and touch the majority of them. It's just a small few that they want to focus on. Jesus actually gave even more. This is pretty amazing. I'm going to leave some links in the description. There's at least, there's like a thousand and fifty New Testament commands. <laughs> so yeah, even if you understand all that, that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, yeah we, yeah, we get it. But they still have this concept of fasting from sundown to sundown on the seventh day. And that's just a big deal. If you're not doing that, then you're being disobedient to God. They still want to go there. They still don't want to like let that one go. And so to that whole matter, this, this whole matter of, of what it means, because really that whole topic of what does it mean to, to keep the Sabbath, if you're even talking about a day, if you're, t if you're even talking about an observance, what does it mean to, to keep this, to observe the Sabbath? You know, it's, it's essentially a day, a day of rest, a day of fasting, where you don't, you don't work, you don't cook, you don't run around doing stuff, it's just supposed to be a day, it's, it's a day of fasting, right? And it's really interesting what Isaiah 58 has to say about the whole topic of fasting, of resting, of thinking that you're setting aside time or making a special devotion to God, however you want to describe it. It's all the same thing. Isaiah 58, Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me of righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the strap of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked, to cover him, and to not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. Then you shall cry and say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour out yourself for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fall. Your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt, and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall delight in the Lord. I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of, of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here's another question, just to be blunt. Why are people so upset about people gathering on the wrong day? Oh, well, you're on Sun. You're gathering on Sunday. I'm gathering on Saturday. So therefore, if you're singing praises to God and I'm singing praises to God, you got the wrong day. I actually had a woman leave a comment the other day, saying that if you worship on Sunday, that Lucifer gets the the credit for your praise. You're actually worshiping Lucifer, which which absolutely blows my mind. How twisted that kind of thinking is. Like, how far off the rails people are, are going. Do they actually believe that? That is the epitome of legalistic deception. Because do you not see 
If the only critique is that you're doing it on the wrong day, even if I'm not gathered with anyone on, on Sunday, even if I'm just by myself at home, as I often am, if I say a prayer or sing a song of praise in my heart, or say one uplifting word about God to anyone that points to him, I'm actually worshiping Satan? So basically, you one day out of the week, you can't, you can't even say one positive thing about God, otherwise you're actually worshiping Satan? Do, do you not see the problem? Do you not see the pit that you're falling into that it's just ridiculous? But no, you're all focused about the wrong day. You're fasting on the wrong day. You're worshiping on the wrong day. You're honoring the wrong day. No. God isn't talking about the day. He's talking about what are you doing? What's going on in your heart? Your fasting should be about feeding the hungry, bringing the homeless and the poor into your house, covering the naked, loosing the bonds of wickedness, letting the oppressed go free. That's worship. Sitting around and, and putting ash on your face and looking somber or fixating on what you're not doing outwardly completely misses the spirit of the law. You're only trying to observe it. You're not trying to like let it penetrate the way you live and the way you think and the way you go out and treat other people. Because guess what? If you're going out and feeding the hungry, that's, that's work, right? You can't do that if you're just sitting in your house. So if you're if you're all gung ho about the Sabbath, why aren't you out there telling people to go feed the hungry on the Sabbath on Saturdays? If that's what it's all about, if if it's all about Saturday, you're just going to go inside and and be so glad that you're not worshiping on Sunday, so glad that you're that you're being obedient. It's about serving and, and loving others. And guess what? You can do that on more than just Saturday. Wow, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. The spirit of the law. Because honestly, and this is... I know people aren't going to want to hear this, but the whole reason why people are attracted to observing things like a, a ritualistic Saturday Sabbath, because that's easy, right? That's terribly damn easy to just come up with some sort of regimen of oh f for this whole day we're gonna, just going to do this and it's not on sunday <laughs> but what jesus says in matthew 5 about not even letting lust or anger in your heart that's a whole nother level of, of obedience to the law it's a whole nother level and there's a reason you don't hear people emphasizing the part in the same chapter they'll quote matthew 5 17 at you all day long and they never make it down to 21 and 27. I wonder why. Because it completely blows apart this whole delusional idea that you're that you're being obedient just because you do outward things. The issue of obedience is of is in the heart. Circumcision, that's what circumcision of the heart means. It means you've been renewed from within by the Spirit of Christ through faith. And now you're going back to outward things. You're going back to elementary observances. We are not called to observe the law, because you can only observe something outwardly. Outward things, outward rituals. You're just putting on t-shirts. T-shirts of self-righteousness. Of outward obedience. Rather than stepping forward in faith and clothing yourself in, in the righteousness of Christ. Where his obedience, his obedience, his perfect sinless life is the only way that we can even conceive of having the audacity to think that we could be obedient to God's perfect law on a heart level. The whole point of the Mosaic Law is they, they couldn't even do it on the outward level. And so this whole notion of lawlessness... That the rejection of this, this Torah-keeping idea is preaching lawlessness. It is the absolute opposite. If anything, people are running to Torah observance because they are running from the true call to obedience. The true call to let the Word of God and the Spirit of God 
have control over every part of your life, every day of the week, every thought that you think, every word that you say, every situation that you find yourself in, every person that you come across who might need to be ministered to. Jesus says, if somebody asks, give. If they tell you to go one mile, you go two. If they ask for your code, you give them your cloak as well. That's obedience. So, yeah. Lawlessness. I'll just close by reading uh, 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us.